to Chairman Shakia and continued service to Marsh Harbor folks if you are checked in for this. When we arrived on Abaco on January 20th, um, I don't think I was quite prepared for the scope of the damage caused by Hurricane Dorian. Here we were five months after the hurricane, yet the amount of damage in some areas was, was so complete and you could tell clearly that some of the forests were not going to come back. Hurricane Dorian caused significant damage to the, to the island of Grand Bahama and parts of Abaco. The Bahamas is adapted to hurricanes, yes, but the frequency of hurricanes can have a negative effect on Bahamian biodiversity and it only takes, it only takes one major storm to basically cause the extinction of many species of birds um, and other animals. And these animals can be very sensitive to changes in their environment and when a hurricane passes through, sometimes the hurricane can be strong enough to um, hit a population so hard that it does not recover. And that's something that we've been seeing with um, birds in the northern Bahamas, namely the Bahama warbler, and how its numbers it looks like, like it took a major, a major blow on Grand Bahama um, after Hurricane Dorian passed through. Range-restricted species, especially these birds that live on islands, are more vulnerable to idiosyncratic events like hurricanes than a bird that might be much more widespread on the continent because their range is much smaller, so one storm or one event can have a much larger effect on the population. Seeing how Dorian has impacted the environment and the bird life around me, having, uh, having been in Abaco for a number of years, just it's heartbreaking, it's heartbreaking to see. And um, hopefully these studies could show a little bit more insight as, what, as to what we have to do to make this environment how it was. First, I want to say my heart goes out to the, the residents of Abaco because they are digging out of, of a, a really devastating uh, natural disaster and I really feel for them. Um, so much of the town, of course, was heavily, heavily damaged. Um, and then in the outskirts, as we um, started to look at bird populations in different areas, it was very apparent that the pine forests around uh, Marsh Harbor were uh, very, very heavily impacted with uh, many, many dead pines, broken pines, extensive areas of dead mangrove. Um, and so these are habitats that were effectively lost to birds. Um, our census has turned up uh, a few birds in these habitats, but very few. Uh, but then when you get away from the storm damaged areas, um, you know, numbers of birds, both residents and migrants, uh, picked up. I am in the Pinelands of South Abaco in Abaco National Park, one of the most amazing national parks in the Bahamas. This morning we just saw about six pirates flying through the Pinelands. It is cool, actually quite cold this morning, but we hope to see more birds as we continue doing our work. Currently we're doing point counts in the Pinelands just to get an idea of what the population of different species of birds are in the park with special focus on pirates and resident birds. Just completed some point counts here in the pine forest. As you can hear, there's still some birds chipping around us. We got some mixed flocks, a number of warblers. The purpose of these point counts is the standardized method of counting the number of birds in a certain amount of area. They're, they can be repeated. So we're repeating these points that were done several years ago to see if there's been any change. We can also compare the points here in the pine forest that's pretty healthy and doesn't show much damage from the hurricane to points further north where there was significant damage from the hurricane. So that's the general idea. South Abaco was pristine. Um, the habitat looked very good. We didn't see any major um, damage, especially in Abaco National Park. It looked as though nothing had happened to it. Um, but when we went north uh, in, into like Marsh Harbor, that's when we saw that catastrophic damage in the, in, uh, to the, the pineland environment. So we are in North Abaco, and this is a completely different uh, environment from where we came from in South Abaco. South Abaco it looked as though nothing hit it, but when we came, when we came up here, these fallen trees, it's like dead, dead and dying pine. We saw heavy damage in North Abaco. We saw lots of fallen trees, lots of trees that were bent over. We saw lots of dead 
uh, trees standing. It was absolutely horrific. When we went into these areas, you could just hear a pin drop. There's like no birds singing, no nothing, because there's nothing there for them. And so that was something that was a big, it was a big shock to us um, to see that level of damage and how that hurricane had such an effect on the Bahamian terrestrial environment, the pine, the pineland environment. It was riveting to walk through a pine forest and not see a healthy tree standing. In Grand Bahama, compared to Abaco, we found areas where there was only a palm warbler. In Abaco, there were areas where you could go to a healthy pine forest and see the full complement of native diversity. In Grand Bahama, you go to a healthy pine forest and we were lucky enough to see a pair of hairy woodpeckers, but we never found a Bahama warbler. Uh, Bahama nuthatches haven't been seen since 2018. These hurricanes are having an immense impact on these systems and it's not just the wind taking down trees, but it's saltwater inundation. It's also the canal system that has made the land more vulnerable, more porous. And then when you go to the shoreline, you see casuarina trees toppled over in areas that might have been nesting ground for shorebirds. So it's a year since the whole experience and just trying to recollect what we saw on the ground, I'm brought back to a somber place where I'm worried about biodiversity on those islands from now and in the future. Hurricane Dorian didn't just affect the Pinelands, it affected the Bahamian coppice and it affected the mangroves. The mangroves did take a beating in the northern parts of Abco, for example. We saw tremendous damage to the mangrove ecosystem. Now, everybody knows that mangroves help to buffer storm surge and help to neutralize the, the strength that comes with the storm surge. And so the mangroves are doing a, a tremendous job of, having to, of helping to protect the terrestrial environment from major damage from um, Hurricane Dorian storm surges. But they took it at a cost because a lot of the, um, the mangroves have been damaged significantly. Um, will they return? Possibly. Um, but right now it's too early to tell as to what's going to happen um, in, the, in, the, in the future. Mangrove systems are interesting in that they are nurseries for fish and sharks and turtles and conch and also birds. It, one of the questions would be, you know, why would these systems be cradles? Why would these systems be continually used by so many species to raise young? It's because they have different places for these organisms to hide. It's because the terrestrial systems are detached from other terrestrial systems, so terrestrial predators can't move back and forth. You know, but these systems here were stripped during that storm. And remarkably, there's a story of humans that actually survived in a mangrove during the storm. So it's, it's impossible for us to separate the, the protective attributes of a mangrove system for humans as we look at them and we think about the protective attributes they have for the organisms that live in those systems. So we're here today to uh, have a look at the Lacayan National Park and what transpired after Hurricane Dorian. Hurricane Dorian definitely had a really good go at this national park. It was really important to come in and actually have a good look at the swimming pool that was created just off of the boardwalk, for example, that wasn't there just before the hurricane. And it's really interesting to see how the, the sand has been quite quickly coming back. So basically the science team wanted to come down here and start capturing some of the data of what's actually going on. We're also taking some data on the vegetative zones as we um, go inland, just having a look at what plants are there. And right now we're seeing a lot of dead plants, so there is not much to record. But when we come back, we're intending to do some some planting of some sand dunes, some planting of some mangroves, and then we're gonna hopefully record the recovery of those plants. And hopefully we'll be able to see the replenishment of the sand dune over time. National parks are a very important tool for helping to combat climate change. The reason why is because these are specific sites that have their own legislation, they're put aside, to ensure that they are um, healthy environments moving on into the future. As climate starts changing, there's gonna be a lot of stress on all of our environments. Uh, one thing that we do know is any environment that particularly is heavily impacted by human activity, and that's like careless development or 
uh, pollution and the spreading of invasive species, those areas, those ecosystems are getting weaker over time. And as climate starts to change, those systems are gonna break down faster and they're not gonna be able to provide the services to humans and to the rest of nature as it's supposed to. And so, as I was saying, national parks are these spaces that are put aside to be able to answer that for us. If we're able to manage these spaces effectively, giving nature that lives in these areas the best chance to um, com combat uh, changing climates by removing pollution, by ensuring they have good genetic diversity, ensuring that the um, populations are healthy and as, as much as possible that can live in that space and time, then we should have a healthier system moving forward into an unpredictable future. As storms like Hurricane Dorian ravage through our country, it is gonna be those most healthy ecosystems that are really going to help the other ecosystems bounce back. There are gonna be the genetic pools to be able to replenish the other areas. And so if we're able to really focus on our protected areas, I really do believe that protected areas can become one of the answers to climate change. When we talk about national parks and being able to protect the environment, national parks are great examples of ways in which you can protect the natural environment and protect the native species that are found here, including the endemic species. On Abaco, for example, um, Abaco National Park now is a major, um, a major place for our endemic birds that got hammered by Hurricane Dorian, especially the ones on um, on Grand Bahama. We may not be seeing Bahama warblers anymore on Grand Bahama, um, but we're glad to see that they're still alive and thriving on Abaco, especially in Abaco National Park. Well, my experience uh, from birding here in South Abaco, you know, prior to the storm, on this trip, I've noticed that there's a more diverse birds here than I've seen before, personally. Uh, whether or not that's because they're all congregating in one location now because of the, the limited uh, food source throughout the island. Um, but I'm pretty sure that the storm had some effect on, the, on why we're seeing more uh, diversity of birds in this particular area. So what do we do? Um, and uh, now the remaining habitat for those species on Abaco and Grand Bahama such as in Abaco National Park, has just become astronomically more important uh, to these birds. These pine habitats have, have a lot of values to, uh, to the Bahamas um, for timber extraction, uh, watershed conservation, protector, protection of freshwater resources, soil conservation. Um, so they're, they're important in a lot of different ways. So recovery of these pine forests is, is not something that we would do solely for birds. Uh, because there are so many other benefits um, to uh, recovering these habitats. So this could be a long-term process and um, where um, I think uh, the government, uh, forestry and, uh, and BNT need to look, uh, look hard at, uh, at what areas could potentially be replanted in pine, um, you know, where they would have the, uh, the highest likelihood of survival. Um, to recover some of that habitat for pine-dependent bird species and, uh, and also to protect some of those other values um, that are important to, uh, to people as well as to birds. A lot of the birds that occur here in the Bahamas, like those I mentioned, the Bahama warbler, the Bahama yellowthroat, the Bahama parrot, they don't occur anywhere else. So these birds are really special and um, often I go to places and the, the, the people I encounter don't fully recognize how special their birds are, that, that they only live here because that, those are the birds that they see in their daily lives and they don't realize that going back, going out a little bit ways from, from where they live, there aren't any of those birds. So the birds that you have here in the Bahamas are unique to the Bahamas. They're very special to the Bahamas. You have fantastic natural heritage and so for Bahamians, I would encourage you to contact Bahamas National Trust and learn more about them, learn how you might be able to support them, learn if there are any volunteer activities that you could engage in to help them in their mission, whether it be 
bird surveys or forest planting, uh, forest restoration, um, or any kind of activities that they may need help with. But call Bahamas National Trust, learn about what you can do to help them, and probably the very first step is visit one of the national parks here in the Bahamas. They're beautiful and uh, they're here for you. It's really important for all levels of society to help get the environment in the right direction where it's supposed to go. Everyone in the Bahamas relies heavily on the environment, whether it's tourism, whether it's the real estate industry, whether you just have um, an Airbnb or a restaurant out on the beach. All of these businesses rely on the fact that uh, people want to travel to the, our country to come and sit on our pristine beaches and look at lovely fish in the sea, etc., etc. So the environment is really important to um, the corporate sector um, and all of us individually. So we do feel that everyone benefits from this work and so therefore we do call on everybody to be able to contribute to um, helping us help the environment.